Hello, everybody. Thanks for uh, tuning in uh, to the YouTube channel of New Macedonia Baptist. And I just want to thank Brother Randall for giving me the opportunity to teach Bible study tonight virtually. And I just pray that uh, we look at a few things and, uh, and uh, be instructed out of God's Word tonight. Uh, I'm looking forward to being with you for the next couple weeks. And I guess I'll see you all Sunday in person. And uh, we'll open up the Word of God then as well and have a good time around that then. Uh, right now, I want to go to Job 38 and look at Job chapter 38, verse 22 and 23. There's a couple interesting things in this passage about snow and hail. So I wanted to look at those just briefly for a few minutes and look at the prophetic uh, meaning, I guess, of what we find in, this, in, this, uh, in these couple of verses. So look at Job 38 and verse, uh, verse 22. It says, Hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow, or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail, which I have reserved against the time of trouble, against the day of battle and war? And what's going on here in this chapter is God, if you've ever read the book of Job, um, he's been going back and forth with his three friends. And then uh, another guy enters the fray uh, in like Job chapter 30, uh, somewhere around in there. And then in, in, right here um, in chapter 38, God, uh, God steps in and begins to talk to Job. Uh, the fellow before, before God talked was Elihu. And, uh, but God begins to, st to speak here. What he's doing is he's pointing out Job's self-righteousness and uh, Job's shortcomings, and he's saying things like, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth, and those kind of things. And then he talks about this peculiar thing in, in uh, 22 and 23, where he says, hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow, or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail? which I've reserved against the time of trouble, against the day of battle and war. Now, all the obvious answers to these things are no. No, Job, you haven't. Were you around when I laid the foundations of the earth? No. All right, so the, the obvious answer to this is no. And what that, that tells you that uh, um, there's, there's something about that thing that he's talking about there that's something that, that Job never seen before. Job never saw that whatever this treasure of the snow is or treasures of the hail, obviously things he's never seen. Um, and you can see there's other prophecies that God gives uh, in this chapter. If you look at verses 12 to 13, look at that. Hast thou commanded the morning since thy days and caused the day spring to know his place? That's another word for the sun. Of course, Christ is a type of the sun. And then look at verse 13 that it might take hold of the ends of the earth, that the wicked might be shaken out of it. That is a prophetic reference there to Christ at his second coming, uh, destroying his enemies and shaking the earth. You read about a shaking that takes place in the book of Haggai and in the book of Hebrews. And that's just a little prophetic hint there in the book of Job where, uh, where God gives that. And then if you look at verse 15, from the wicked... Their light is withholden, and the high arm shall be broken. That's a reference to the Antichrist sustaining an, an injury to, uh, to his arm. That high arm is going to be broke. So there's prophecy in this chapter, and I think chap verses 22 and 23 uh, are, are this prophetic, certainly, about things that God's going to do in the future. Uh, the, see, he's got some things in reserve. If you look at our verses that we're going to look at, he says he's reserved some things against the time of trouble and against the day of battle and war. So these treasures of the snow and treasures of the hail, things he've got, he's got in store for future. There's a future connotation with that. Because when you reserve something for some kind of future event, all right, that's the whole point of reserving it. If I want to reserve a table at a restaurant, I call ahead so that that table's ready when I get there. I call and you know, and I say, hey, I'm going to be there at this point in time. I want my table to be ready. So when God reserves this thing, uh, this treasures of the snow and treasures of the hail, he's reserved it for the time of trouble. That's one period of time. And then the day of battle and war is the second period of time. If these, these two things correlate together, you've got the treasures of the snow. That's, that's one thing. You've got the hail, the treasures of the hail. That's two things. 
those probably correlate with the two time periods found in verse 23. So you've got the time of trouble would probably correlate with the treasures of the snow, and the day of battle and war would correlate to the treasures of the hail. Okay? And that's kind of a system that, uh, that God uses uh, in the Bible through grammar where, where things match up like that uh, when, you, when you're talking about a series of items. So I think those things uh, match up. Now these, these things, this treasure of the snow and treasure of the hail is probably something that, that you and I have never seen it's something that you and I have never experienced on earth. We've seen lots of snow. I've seen hail. Uh, I've seen hail the size of uh, maybe a little smaller than a golf ball before, which is pretty big. Uh, there's been people on the earth that have seen bigger. Um, Job, saw, Job saw hail. Job saw snow. All right. But whatever this thing is here God's talking about, he's saying, you ever seen that? And the obvious answer is, is, is no. No. Um, He's trying to get Job to see how small and insignificant he is. So these things, this this stuff here in verse 22 and 23, uh, are very uh, I, they're all, they're almost supernatural to me when I when I read that. Um, so let's. So what are these things? What is the treasure of the snow, and what is the treasure of the hail? And if they're connected with something that's going to happen in the future, which is kind of what I'm trying to teach today. Then we're going to see. Uh, we're going to try to see what they are and pinpoint them because I think I think the key to these two things, the treasure of the snow, treasure of the hail. I think the key to those is the timeline that he gives you in twenty three and the description of the time periods in verse twenty three. All right. So what do we have uh, in the in verse twenty three? We've got the time of trouble. All right. Now the time of trouble, the time of trouble. That's a phrase that's used a few times in the Bible. It's found in the Psalms, and it's uh, there, in Jeremiah that's called the time of Jacob's trouble, and it's narrowed a little bit, a little more specific there. And uh, uh, what that is, is that's kind of a reference to the end times for Israel. That's, that's a time period of the tribulation. Um, that's a time period of trouble. And uh, that's used pretty often in the, a couple times in the, in the, uh, in the Psalms. And uh, every time you see it, it's always pointing to those end times, that time of affliction and trouble that Israel has to endure. So if that is what that is, and that's kind of how you're supposed to study the Bible, you're supposed to study the Bible with, you know, Scripture with Scripture and comparing things spiritual with things spiritual. So the time of trouble, all right, is it, that's not a reference to, uh, to us right now in 2022 under the Biden administration or something like that, although that we are in troublous times. Uh, right now and and you know with all the wars and stuff going on when you read about the thing in the bible though one of the ways god teaches is through is through keywords and phrases and he'll use certain phrases in the bible and certain keywords and he'll use them on purpose so that you can connect them when you're reading the bible so you see the phrase time of trouble you can go find it somewhere else and you get some light on what what that thing is so this, this stuff is, the, the treasures of the snow looks to be reserved against the time of trouble. So there's some kind of thing that's going to happen with snow, all right, that's going to be used during the time period of the tribulation. Now, come over to Jeremiah 18 and look at Jeremiah chapter 18. If you recall... When Israel was coming through, they came out of the land of Egypt, and when they come out of Egypt, you know, they, they went through a couple dry spells where they didn't have anything to eat, and then they didn't have anything to drink. And of course, when, when, when Israel needed to eat and drink, God provided food for them miraculously. And when he, what he provided for them miraculously was he told Moses, go, go, hit, go take your staff, go hit that rock, hit that stone. And when that stone, when he hit that stone, water came out, and they were able to drink that water. Then he brings them this stuff called manna, all right? And manna is an interesting thing in the Bible, and, and manna was a miraculous feeding. And it was, it's called, manna's called corn, it's called the corn of heaven in the Psalms. It's called angel's food. Um, 
It's called uh, it's called bread. Uh, they made cakes out of it, but the stuff fell out of the sky and landed in the camp, and they had to go collect it up. Now that's some int- the manna is interesting. It it comes. Uh, we're going to look at it a little bit, not a whole lot, but manna is interesting because when it comes, it comes, it's delivered to Israel via precipitation. All right. When the dew would come down and land in the camp and then, you know, like, like dew does, when the sun comes out, it begins to disappear. Uh, the dew does. When the dew would come out and it disappear, there would be the manna land there. And one of the descriptions that that uh, I think Moses gives it is that manna is like the hoar frost. He says it's like white frost, like ice crystals, like snow. If you ever looked at snow, if you look at snow up close, you know what snow is? It's not cotton candy, okay? It kind of looks like cotton candy or or marshmallows. If you look at snow under a microscope, snow is ice crystals. Just a lot of them. All right, you pick up a, a handful of snow in the wintertime and, and you examine it, it's, it's nothing but ice crystals. Okay, uh, and that's kind of what the description of manna is given. It's like the hoar frost. It's like ice crystals. And it, so it looks to be delivered by some kind of pre- precipitation and then when the precipitation's dried up by the sun, there lays the manna. So it falls. It, it falls on the camp like precipitation falls. And it comes down and it's white. And it's like it's kind of like snow, except it's except it's bread. All right, we know it's not it's not actual snow, but it could be delivered like snow. Okay, it's kind of kind of what I'm saying. But but what the point is, Israel's Israel was fed miraculously in the wilderness through manna, through giving of water, through smiting the rock and all that. Look at the Jeremiah 18, 14. <clears throat> now, what, this is interesting. Now, the Bible's like this. You'll just be reading through something, and, and this is an example of that. You're reading through Jeremiah, and then this strange verse just shows up out of nowhere. And this verse has got something to do with, with um, miraculous God delivering Israel miraculous, miraculously uh, food and drink. And look what he says in verse 14. Will a man leave the snow of Lebanon, which cometh from the rock of the field? The snow coming out of a rock there. Or shall the cold flowing waters that come from another place be forsaken? So you've got snow coming out of a rock, and you've got waters from, from another place. Uh, that comes. Uh, come over to uh, Isaiah 33. We'll look at a couple examples of these, this miraculous kind of strange stuff where Israel is fed and, and given drink uh, through miracles. That's what Jesus did in the New Testament, didn't he? Remember when he would feed, he would feed the 5,000 and feed the 4,000? Uh, that, that, that was a miracle feeding, all right? Moses did it in the Old Testament in the wilderness wanderings and things, and Christ does it out in the wilderness in the New Testament, and he kind of does the same thing that Moses does. He feeds Israel miraculously. Um, Isaiah chapter 33, 15. Isaiah 33, 15. Who's going to get the kingdom is what this chapter is about. Who's going to get the kingdom? Who's going to be able to rule on this earth forever in Israel's promised kingdom? And here's the answer. Verse 15, Isaiah 33, 15. He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly, he that despiseth the gain of oppressions, that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes, that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil, he shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks. All right. You know what munitions are? They're supplies. That's where you get, and when an army is looking for munitions, they're looking for supplies. That verse there says that the, Israel's going to be able to get their supplies from rocks. And then he says, bread shall be given him. His waters shall be sure. That right there is a pointing to the end times when Israel's going to have, they're going to be in the wilderness. They're going to be hiding in crags and valleys and they're going to flee to the wilderness and hide. And when they do, 
They're not going to be able to poke their head up. If they do, the Antichrist will get them. So how are they going to eat and drink? You realize during that time, if you, if, like it says in Revelation, if during the tribulation, if a guy doesn't take the mark of the beast, he can't eat or drink or buy or sell. Israel, in opposition to that Antichrist, to the man of sin, they're going to flee into the wilderness and be fed miraculously by God. Like he did in the Old Testament during the Exodus, where they're fed using rocks and precipitation, and they're going to be given bread and water in miraculous ways so that they can eat and function during that time of hiding that they're going to be in. Look at Psalm 147. Psalm 147. Um, and we're going to look at a couple more verses about this. So what has this got to do with snow, Ryan? What's this got to do with snow? Well, that miraculous food that he gave them called manna came, like, came down in the camp like precipitation. It came down like, and it, when they looked at it, you know what manna means? It means, what is this? When Israel walked up and looked at it, they said, what in the world is this thing? Matter of fact, one place, I think it's in the book of Numbers, uh, it's recorded that, that, that manna looks like bdellium. Bdellium is a, is a white crystallized gum resin that comes out of a tree. And uh, when, when they didn't know what it was because it was a unique, manna's unique. It's what is this stuff? It was, not, not, it was like nothing they'd ever ate, nothing they ever saw before. But when he tries to describe it, he says it's the color of bdellium and it's kind of like that. Bedellium was little, little hardened. If you can think of something, think of like a a tree that oozes out sap, and then when that sap comes out, it gets hard, right? That's kind of what bedellium is. Bedellium is a is a is a white sappy stuff that comes out of a tree, and it gets hard and crystallizes, and it looks like it kind of looks like rock candy. If you ever, if you want to Google it or look and look at it, bedellium does. All right, and when, when it's described of what, what does Moses, um, when he describes that in the book of Numbers, he says, that is kind of like, kind of like bedellium. Uh, Psalm 147, verse 15. He sendeth forth his commandment upon earth. His word runneth very swiftly. He giveth snow like wool. He scattereth the hoarfrost. That's what Moses said that the manna looked like, the hoarfrost. He scattered that like ashes. He casteth, <clears throat> look at this, it's interesting. Look at this, connected with food. He casteth forth his ice like morsels. Who can stand before his cold? You know what a morsel is? A morsel is something you eat. Now you say, I don't, I don't, you're making too much of that, Ryan. Well, those little things are thrown in the Bible so that you can make the connections. All right, so what do we got? Well, we got, we've got a thing in Job where we started where it says that, that uh, uh, the treasures of the snow are reserved for the time of trouble. It's reserved for a future event called the time of trouble. So there's something that's in snow. That when that snow comes down, there's something in that snow that's considered a treasure, Okay. And God, it's a provision that God is going to provide for Israel during the time of trouble. And it comes down and they can actually eat it. And it's manna. And it comes like hoarfrost and it's cast forth like ice and it falls like ice and it falls like snow. And it's considered like Psalm 147, 17, he casteth forth his ice like morsels. All right. Two more places. Look at Micah. Micah, the book of Micah, chapter 7, all right, Micah chapter 7, uh, verse 14. This is a prophecy that God is going to feed Israel in the wilderness like he did in the days of old, okay? Micah seven fourteen. Feed thy people with thy rod, the flock of thine heritage, which dealt, dwell solitarily in the wood, See, they're out in the wilderness. They're in the wood. They're, in the, they're hiding. In the midst of Carmel, let them feed in Bashan and Gilead 
as in the days of old. Look at 15. According to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt, will I show unto him marvelous things. He says, I'm going to do for Israel what I did during their Egypt, when they exodus out of Egypt, when they came out of Egypt. You know what happened? I did all kinds of stuff, man. I split the Red Sea for them. I fed them miraculously. I fed them out of a, a rock, a rock, just an old rock. We hit that rock, water come out, and they were able to drink from that and be refreshed. I gave them food in the camp, manna that just fell out of the sky. That's, that It was food for angels. And he says, all that stuff I did back there, according to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt, he says, just like the things you that Israel experienced back then, they're going to experience again, and I'm going to show unto him again in the, out in the future. I'm going to show him marvelous things, marvelous things. Come over to Revelation, look at Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2, and then we're going to look at the stones, the hailstones, and then we're going to be done. Revelation chapter 2. So the treasures of the snow, I'm going to say the treasures of the snow that's reserved for the time of trouble is precipitation that comes down out of the sky supernaturally and feeds Israel. And it's bread. It's bread from heaven. It's manna. They're going to get manna again, okay? And it falls with the snow. Uh, when the snow comes and then the snow melts, there lays the manna. It comes down in the snow, and then when the snow, the sun comes up and the snow melts it, there it lays, just like in the days of old in the book of Exodus. All right, Revelation 2, look at verse 17. These are the promises for the overcomers. All right. These churches are tribulation kingdom churches in Revelation 2 and 3. All right. None of the stuff in here matches the body of Christ. None of it. All right. You can see that in chapter 2, verse 17 especially. Look at this. There's a promise here that people out in the future are going to get hidden manna again. And what I'm telling you right now is basically this. This stuff, this hidden manna that we're reading about, all right, in verse 2, 17, that's the treasures of the snow, all right? It's hidden it's hidden in precipitation. It's hidden in snow, just like in the book of Exodus when it would come down with the dew, all right, with the hoarfrost. 2.17 in Revelation. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a, a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. All right, so an overcomer during that time, if he can overcome the trib the antichrist if he can overcome to a certain point during that time period and make it out into the wilderness you know christ told those jews he said when you see the abomination of desolation set up in the in the holy place flee don't go back to get stuff out of your house just take off and flee and go hide and uh that's why it's called the hidden manna because he's going to feed them again miraculously so that little thing, that little nugget there laying in the book of Job in chapter 38 about the treasures of the snow reserved against the time, reserved against the time of trouble, all right, God's got a provision for Israel. He's going to provide for them, and he's going to be able to provide them food uh, to eat. So what is that stuff coming down? That stuff is snow-wrapped bread or ice-wrapped bread that falls for them, and they can go pick it up and eat it. He casteth forth his ice like morsels, okay? Truth, you know the old saying, truth is stranger than fiction? That's the case many, many times in the Bible, all right? Then we've got the treasures. The other thing he talked about was the treasures of the hail. And the treasures of the hail, hail and snow are different, all right? Snow, snow is soft, you can take snow, pick it up in your hand, do that with it, it'll fall. Hail is a big, a big ball of hard ice, okay? And hail's different. You throw a snowball at somebody, all right? I mean, if you pack it tight, you might hurt them, but typically a snowball doesn't hurt when you get hit with it. 
you throw a hailstone at somebody, you're going to knock them out. I mean, they're going to be, they're going to short circuit and they're going to have to, you know, get the smelling salts out or something if you club somebody with a hailstone. So, hail, hail and snow are different. That's why they're distinct in, that, in our verse in Job 38. The treasures of the snow is different than the treasures of the hail. All right, the treasures of the snow is reserved um, for the time of trouble. The treasures of the hail is reserved against the day of battle and war. Okay, now, come back to Joshua uh, ver uh, chapter 10, back in the Old Testament. Joshua, uh, Joshua chapter 10. So, the day of battle of war, the day of battle and war, all right, whereas the treasures of the snow is probably a provision and it's probably a, uh, something that they can eat and sus it helps sustain them, this this treasures of the hail looks like to be a uh, a weapon used in battle. And that's not uncommon for God to do. All right? He's done it before. He did it in the book of Joshua. Look at Joshua chapter 10. Uh, look at verse, uh, let's start in verse 8. All right, Joshua 10, 8. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. Joshua therefore came up, uh, came unto them suddenly and went, went up from Gilgal all night. And the Lord discomfited them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon and chased them along the way that goeth up to Beth Horon and smote them to Azekah and unto Makedah. And it came to pass as they fled from before Israel uh, and were in the going down to Beth Horon that the Lord, now watch, this is wild that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Azekiah, and they died. Now watch. Look at what kind of stones these are. All right? At the end of the verse. They were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. So what do you got there? Man, you've got Israel's enemies. What do you got? you got God... God, the Lord, personally casting down great hailstones on them and giving Israel a military victory through the bombardment of hailstones, okay? So when we read about this prophecy, this prophetic nugget, this hint over there, that where God says, hey, Job, Job, do you know anything about the treasures of the hail, the treasures of the snow? The obvious answer is no, you don't. All right. And he says, I've reserved it against the day of battle and war. God's got a, he's got an, he's got an artillery um, cache, cache of hailstones that are reserved to be used out in the future. All right. In a military way. All right. And, uh, that is not something that is foreign. If you know the Bible and you know some prophetic areas of the Bible, you see that happen um, in some other areas. So you see it historically in Joshua 10 where God cast great hailstones. Now, I don't know what great means there. In Joshua 10, it doesn't clarify. But them things probably the size of bowling balls, all right? Maybe bigger than that. And let me tell you something. A ball of ice the size of a bowling ball or basketball coming down that weighs about 100 pounds can do some serious, serious damage, all right? And you know why that's called a treasure? It's called a treasure because that's what, that's what destroys Israel's enemies in the end times, all right? Now, come over to uh, Ezekiel. Look at Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 38, and look at verse uh, 18. And it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog, this course end times, this is the battle of Gog and Magog and all that, chapter 38 and 39. And uh, Gog, a lot of people butcher Gog. They think that's some kind of, of Russian ruler, and they think Magog's Russia. I don't believe that Gog and Magog is Russia and a, and a Russian ruler. Uh, Gog... Uh, look at verse 17. Thus saith the Lord God, look at this. Art thou he, talking to Gog, art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time 
by my servants, the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them. Who's a reoccurring character in the prophets that is that is prophesied repeatedly to Israel that there's going to come a, a particular man that's going to give them trouble? Who is that in Israel's prophets and prophecies uh, through their prophets that prophesied since old time? Well, it's the Antichrist, all right? Gog is the Antichrist, not some Russian ruler, all right? But anyway, that's what's going on, all right, in, in chapter 38. Then look down at verse 22. I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood. And I will rain upon him and upon his bands and, and upon the many people that are with him an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. There is a future instance where God sends down a bombardment and an artillery fire using hailstones. All right. He did it in the time of Joshua. He's going to do it in the end times uh, with the armies of the Antichrist. And then look over, of course, at uh, uh, Revelation 16. Not too many people pick up on the one in Ezekiel 36 about the hailstones, but a lot of people know about this one in Revelation 16. Look at Revelation chapter 16, verse 21. Revelation 16, 21. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven. Every stone. Now here, here we actually get a glimpse into the, uh, the size and weight of these hailstones that God's going to give during the tribulation. All right. And these things are about a talent. They have suckers weigh anywhere from, depending on what you believe a talent is, a talent can weigh anywhere between 75 and 150 pounds. Now, that is a, that is a stinking heavy ball of ice, all right? Don't talk about smashing a car or smashing a tank. You get one of those flying through, the, through space and then down through the atmosphere about 1,000 miles per hour and hit. You know what would happen if that would hit a person? It would, they'd disintegrate, man. They'd vaporize. There wouldn't be nothing left. It would totally destroy a tank. It would totally destroy a car totally destroy a building and uh that's what it said and there fell upon every man uh, uh, i'm sorry and there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven every stone about the weight of a talent and men blasphemed god because of the plague of the hail for the plague thereof was exceeding great all right now god's going to use hail the point i'm trying to show you there is god's going to use hail and he's going to use uh he's going to use they're, they're called hailstones. Now, our text over there in Job says the treasures of the hail. And there's going to come a time when God uses hail, all right, to bring forth some military victories and to bring forth some, some strikes against the wicked of the world that are, that are running things, the wicked armies during the, the tribulation period and during the end times. And those hailstones are big stones of ice. That's what hail is, all right? Um, when you think about how many times in the Bible God uses stones, all right, as a tool of judgment, okay, you, you're, you're going to see that fairly often. Um, when, when some, under the law in the Old Testament, when a man would commit a grievous sin like adultery or murder, what was God's choice of judgment that was supposed to be imposed on that individual. He would tell them, stone him with stones. God's choice of judgment just seems like a lot of times is stones. Um, you think about David. You know what David used to bring down Goliath? He used a flying rock, okay? You know what, when you stone somebody, if an adulterer or a murderer or something happens, somebody commits that, you know what, what gets them? A flying rock gets them, a flying stone. All right, so that, the, all that stuff, the, the, you know, stoning somebody with stones, David using a stone and cracking Goliath in the head, who's a type of the Antichrist, the type of Israel's enemy that gets brought down uh, by 
by a stone, a smooth stone, and all that. Uh, that is all. Those are all. You know. You know what. You know what. You know what. Uh, you know what Psalm seventy eight says. Psalm seventy eight says that that the whole Old Testament was a parable. In other words, a parable is not a made-up story. A parable is something par parallel. That P-A-R-A at the beginning of it, it's a parallel. All right? A parable is a story that runs alongside and is parallel to another story. That Old Testament is a parable, all right, of something that's going to happen in the future uh, with Israel. That's why a lot of the stuff that happens in the Old Testament is going to be repeated in the future with the with the manna and the coming, the exodus and the fleeing into the wilderness and the the parting of the Red Sea and the going over Jordan and the, and the the stones and the stoning people and the thing with David and the stones and all all that stuff is all significant and all has a point <coughs> and a purpose to it. It's not just randomly thrown in your Bible um, and and. This thing about flying stones, all right, is interesting because look, if if you come back to Daniel, look at look at Daniel, look at Daniel chapter uh, Daniel chapter two, and in Daniel two, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream about this image, and I'm not going to teach about the image, but I just want I just want you to see that what these are is the Gentile nations that are going to rule over Israel during the times of the Gentiles. And uh, these things are, are relayed and interpreted as being a head of gold, uh, breast and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, feet part iron, part clay. And that's in verse 32 and 33 in Daniel 2. Look what hits those that image. It is that Something strikes that image. And brings it something strikes those Gentile powers, and brings that brings that image down, brings those powers, those Gentile nations down, brings them down, and uh, that is in verse thirty-five. Look at look at Daniel two, uh, I'm sorry, verse thirty-four. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. You've got a stone hitting that image. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. You've What you've got there, that's, that smiting stone is, is Jesus Christ. All right, Smashing his enemies and smashing the Gentile powers at his second coming. And he's likened to a smiting stone there that comes flying out of the out of the sky and strikes uh, and strikes and brings forth a military victory and destroys those uh, those Gentile nations. Look at Luke chapter twenty. Luke chapter twenty, and we're about done. Luke chapter twenty. Uh, look at Luke chapter twenty, verse seventeen. And he beheld them and said, What is this then that is written, The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? Talking about himself. All right? One of the prophecies is that Jesus Christ is like a stone. All right? Look what that stone does. Verse 18. Whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken. Okay? Okay? But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. You've got a falling, flying rock, a falling, flying stone there that's grinding people to powder. You better make sure that uh, you're on the same side as the stone because you don't want to be you don't want to be the recipient of Jesus Christ, the the uh, the smiting stone. It doesn't roll and get them. It falls choom, and gets them. It's in an elevated position and, <clears throat> and comes down and gets them. Now those two, those two treasures, the treasures of the snow and the treasures of the hail, I think are prophetic things about the end times. The treasures of the snow are provisions. It's manna, most likely that falls with the snow and Israel is able to collect it up and eat it. And then, of course, 
the treasures of the hail is when God rescues Israel and helps Israel militarily during the end times by bringing hail out of the sky, and that's why it's likened to, to treasure. So it's not a provision, it's, a, it's military assistance during their time of need in the day of great battle and, and great war. Now, close with this. Snow is soft, and snow, that was the first thing we taught, treasure of the snow, treasure of the hail. Snow is soft and enjoyable. Kids like to go out and play in the snow, all right? When it's snowing, people like to go out, stick their tongues out, you know, catch snow on their tongue. Listen, if there's, if there's hail falling the size of golf balls around here even, you don't go out and open your mouth. You know what'll happen if you go outside and open your mouth in a hailstorm? It'll knock your teeth plumb, <laughs> plumb out of your head, all right? So what I'm saying is snow is soft and typically enjoyable, and hail... Hail is typically connected with judgment, and hail is hard, okay? And I think, I think there's also something there, kind of a parallel, too, with, with Christ's comings. At his first coming, he was meek and lowly and soft, like snow. At his, you know what manna was? It was bread from heaven. You know what Jesus told them at his first coming? He says, I'm the bread from heaven. I'm, I'm the bread from heaven. And he fed him miraculously in the wilderness at his first coming. All right? So at, the, at, his, at his first coming, he comes like bread. And he comes as a person that feeds. All right? And that provides sustenance and gives provisions. His second coming, he's not like snow and he's not like manna and bread. He's not coming to offer anybody anything to eat at his second advent. You know what he's coming? He's coming to smite. He's coming to tear things up and destroy, and that's what hail does. So at the second coming, at his first coming, he's like snow and manna and bread from heaven. That's what he said about himself in John chapter 6. He said, Moses didn't give you the true bread from heaven. I'm the true bread. from." And he likens himself to manna, okay? So the manna and the snow and all that and the hoar frost connected with his first coming and the hailstones and the stones, you know, flying out of the sky and striking things is a picture of his second coming. Him as the great smiting stone. And just like anything else, when you see stuff in the Old Testament that's, that is a shadow of something in the future, more often than not, it's got to do with Jesus Christ, and it's some kind of shadow and picture of something that represents him um, at his comings and him uh, fulfilling his purposes uh, out in the future or at his first coming that we know about in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All right, the treasures of the snow and the treasures of the hail. Truth is stranger than fiction, and uh, there's a lot in that Bible, a lot of interesting things. And uh, maybe next time it snows, even though we're, we've got spring, next time it snows or hails, you think about that for a minute and say, oh, the treasures of the snow and the treasures of the hail. I remember that back in Job 38. All right, thanks for, for uh, tuning in to Bible study uh, tonight, and I appreciate all y'all, and I will see you guys Sunday morning, Lord willing. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your book. Thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to do this virtually, for the technology to be able to do it. And I pray, Lord, for all the folks at New Macedonia Baptist Church, and I pray that we'd have a good service Sunday. And I pray you'd bless it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.